dresses you? What? Who dresses you? I mean, do you think this is a little excessive for the Carolina League? The road of excess leads to the Palace of Wisdom, William Blake. Bull Durham. William. To a second honeymoon. Second honeymoon. Eighteen more years together. Eighteen. Or would you say it was seventeen? No, it's eighteen, all right. The well, Accidental you... Tourist. What's in there? My lingerie. <laughs> See, <Ryan>. <laughs> <laughs> Who framed Roger Rabbit? The place, what do these boys. three films have in common? No Each stories. is on either Roger's or my list of the top ten films of 1988, which we'll be revealing on this special edition of Cisco and Ebert. I'm Gene Cisco of the Chicago Tribune. And I'm Roger Ebert of the Chicago Sun-Times. Picking a best ten list is an annual ritual for almost every movie critic that I know, even though, of course, any list like this has got to be a little ridiculous because you're comparing apples and oranges and then you're numbering them from one to ten. But that's what we're going to do on this show, counting down the four, three, two, and one positions on each of our lists, and then giving you the whole list at the end. The best thing about best ten lists is that they give you a chance to propagandize for a favorite film that might have gotten overlooked during the year, and that's what I'm going to do with my choice for the fourth best film of 1988, which I think was Shy People. This was the epic film directed by Andre Konchalovsky and set in the bayous of Louisiana. The movie star Jill Clayburgh is a sophisticated Manhattan magazine writer, and Barbara Hershey is her long-lost cousin who lived in isolation in a Louisiana swamp. The women come from totally different backgrounds, but as they get to know each other, they share some secrets. I'm Julia to keep on running. I only see them Sundays when I bring a basket. Right here. You mean you knew where he was? Well, everybody knew where he was. They just didn't know when he'd be there. I've seen Shy People three times now, and I think it's a brave and powerful film, a movie that's not afraid of telling a melodramatic story about big emotions. It's the kind of movie that they used to make back before everybody got so afraid of taking chances and looking ridiculous. Modern movie makers are really timid compared to some of the films that were made in the 30s and 40s. This film reminded me of. The performances are way out there on a limb, but Hershey and Clayburgh pull them off, and so does Martha Plimpton as the teenage daughter from New York. Shy People got hardly any good reviews. In fact, even the distributor of this film wrote me a letter to say that I was the only critic who liked it, but I did like it. I liked it a lot, and I'm going to stick by that. Well, I'm interested in one thing that you said. First of all, I obviously was one of the critics that didn't care for it that much. I liked Hershey's performance and Plimpton's. It was Clayburgh's that I thought was all over the mat, and more her character, which I didn't find authentic. Uh, but... I'm interested in how you're using your list, which is you say that you're going to propagandize for the little films, or are you just saying it in this case? Because some well, people want to know that you really believe okay, don't have a hidden okay, agenda. Okay, it's a good question. Uh, first of all, it's not a little film. It's a big-budget film. Secondly, when the movie came out, I said it was one of the best films of the year, and I still believe that. So okay. what I'm saying is I think it's a good film. I also want it on the list so that maybe people can get a second chance to see it by renting it in a video store because they didn't get a chance to see it in a movie theater, and it's worth seeing. Okay, well, I uh, don't have any hidden agenda in my list. This is well, actually... Well, that's not a hidden agenda. That's a perfectly legitimate No, uh, I'm, just saying, I'm just saying you, you identified it. It's no longer hidden. We've got it out. You clarified it, and now we'll move on to my list, which is just Wasn't what it is. in the, the first place. The I top announced beforehand. That's what I was But you doing. said it was a good question that I asked you, and so I had to clarify something. It was a tough year for ranking films for me, and a lot of their films were good, but there were very few great ones. My number four choice is called Little Dorrit, the enchanting, touching, epic story of love unspoken among the impoverished in London. It's a Charles Dickens story, and that means a noble hero, in this case a young girl named Little Dorrit, and also a kind but sad and timid character, in this case a man named Arthur Clennon, who loves Little Dorrit but can't find the words to express himself. Arthur visits Little Dorrit and her proud father in a debtor's prison in London. He'll give the father money, but his heart belongs to Little Dorrit. Allow me to see you downstairs. No, no, no. no. Any account. The friend. Allow me. Deeply. Deeply. A superb cast there. Derek Jacoby as the memorable Arthur Clennam. Sarah Pickering as sweet Little Dorrit. And Alec Guinness still proving he's one of our greatest actors as Little Dorrit's father. I almost regret saying that this film runs six hours. It's being shown in two parts. Because that might turn you off. But the time breezed by for me. It's quite an experience, directed cleanly by Christine Edzar. I liked it too, Gene. It's not on my top ten list, but I liked it very much. And I agree with you that six hours isn't too much, because what happens is it plays like a good, long novel. Exactly. You get involved in the rhythms yes. of the lives yes. of these people. 
you know, with a two-hour movie, we've seen so many of them. We know almost the structure. We know right. you can, uh, where the false climax is going to come, where the real climax is going to come. In yes. this movie, it's just the, the rhythm of life, and that became absolutely absorbing for me. I like having my time altered. I like having it play a little more like in real time. It's yeah. a beautiful classic story. It's a good film. When we come back, we'll each have our choices for the third best movie of the year. Three title on my top ten list for 1988 is the year's best romantic comedy, which just happened to be set in the world of baseball. It's Bull Durham, starring Susan Sarandon as a baseball fanatic who loves teaching young minor league players about the game and about life, everything from the curveball to her own curves. The object of her affection is going to be either a wild rookie pitcher played by Tim Robbins or the attractive veteran catcher played by Kevin Costner. These are the ground rules. I hook up with one guy a season. Usually takes me a couple weeks to pick the guy. But kind of my own spring training. And well, you two are the most promising prospects of the season so far. They're great. I'd give an Oscar nomination to each one of those actors and certainly a writing nomination for Ron Shelton, a former minor league baseball player who made his directing debut with this movie. Ron Shelton gets my vote for Rookie of the Year in one of the most joyful original films I've ever seen. Well, once again, a film that's not on my best ten list, but a film that I like. This would be in my second ten for sure. Wow. And uh, the, the most entertaining baseball movie that I can oh, remember no because question. it gets into the personalities of these guys instead of getting into who wins or loses the game. In fact, most of the time I had no idea whether they were winning or losing. I think they lost most of their games, but who cares? Well, it not only loves baseball and truly loves it, but I mean with uh -huh. real affection, not just with some phony, you know, rah-rah apple pie kind of thing, but the real nature of baseball. But it gives us these characters who, if they weren't in baseball, you'd still follow them anywhere. Completely original characters yes. in a year of clones. Okay. My next movie is my choice for the year's third best film. It's The Unbearable Lightness of Being, another great and visionary film by Philip Kaufman, the same man who directed The Right Stuff a few years ago. In this film, based on a novel by the popular Czech writer Milan Kundera, he tells the story of the complicated life of a Prague surgeon who has an understanding with a woman who is both his mistress and his friend until his orderly life is completely upset by his discovery of another young woman that he really does fall in love with. In this scene, the younger girl is jealous of the surgeon's philandering, but their quarrel is upstaged by the brutal intervention of real-life events. Hello. Yes. What? Teresa! And right there, of course, is one of the Russian tanks that invaded Czechoslovakia in 1968. One of the remarkable things this movie does is visually combine the actors of today with the events of 20 years ago in a way that looks completely convincing. It looks like they're right in the middle of that crowd. Another thing it does is create the most frankly erotic and truly adult film since Last Tango in Paris. And yet this is not a cheap or sensational kind of eroticism because what it reflects is a genuine situation involving complicated adults. Two women who are honest about their feelings and a man who has a lot of trouble trusting any woman. The Unbearable Lightness of Being was a completely original film in a year like many years when most films were just attempts to imitate earlier box office hits. I'd never seen anything like this movie, and that's one reason that it's on my list. It's on my list, too. It finished at number nine on my list. Mm -hmm. I think uh, original is quite the word for it. You have to credit again the writer, Milan Kundera. Mm -hmm. um, I complained before about the length of films. We both did. And again, I want to join you in the complaint about most characters who do not live lives as passionately as most of us live our own life. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's the great triumph of this film. You're quite correct. We compared it once before, I think, to Last Tango in Paris. That's 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. Movies have gone soft since then. This film brings back the energy of real life. That's right. Coming up next, more selections from the closer to the top movies on our 10 best films of 1988. Any review of the year's 10 best movies, the number two movie on my list, the year's second best film, is The Accidental Tourist, which is open in a few big cities and is going to open around the country in January. The movie is based on the best-selling novel by Ann Tyler, who told the story of a travel writer who has almost ceased to function since his child was killed a year ago. His wife says she wants a divorce because he can't seem to feel anything anymore, and she's right, until he takes his dog to a kennel one day, and there he meets a woman who seems to believe that he ought to get to know her because she can help him. But I could train him in no time not to bite other people. You think about it and give me a call, Muriel. Remember? Muriel Pritchett. Let me give you my card. Oh, well, I'll bear that in mind. Thank you very much. Or just call for no reason. Call and talk. 
talk? That's William Hurt as the travel writer and Gina Davis in a wonderful performance as the woman who tries to bring life back into his life. But this whole movie is filled with wonderful performances, including good work by Kathleen Turner as Hurt's wife and Amy Wright as his goofy sister. The strange thing about Accidental Tourist is that it's the funniest, serious movie I've ever seen. It's sad, and it's downbeat, and yet it sees these oddball characters so clearly that there were lots of moments of delight as you recognize the funny contradictions in their human natures. The Accidental Tourist was directed by Lawrence Kasdan, who also directed William Hurt and Kathleen Turner in Body Heat, their first big breakthrough movie, and directed Hurt again in The Big Chill. He understands this actor, and The Accidental Tourist is perfect casting for William Hurt. Well, I think William Hurt is one of the great actors of our time, and this is a terrific film. It finished number five on my list, so we get a little bit arbitrary in these numbering, but that's where it landed for me. Uh, I, uh, you've said before this balance between comedy and seriousness, mm -hmm. and I felt the balance was a little bit towards seriousness, yes, and I it enjoyed is, yes. it, mm -hmm. uh, because I, um, saw the pain involved in the William Hurt character, I could relate to it, and uh, the pain that's hidden in a lot of these characters, all in their, living in their little boxes, all with their little rituals that are protecting themselves from really basically crying, or, or a full emotional cry for their condition that they're in, and I thought that this film handled that beautifully. It did, and you know, another thing, he created a counterpoint by creating this goofy family yes. that Hurt comes from, yes. Ed Begley Jr., David Ogden Stiers, and Amy Wright, who live in this house in their own little protected yeah. cocoon and provide kind of comic relief yeah. so that every moment when the movie begins to get just absolutely too depressing, suddenly we're laughing again at this strange family. Just laughing a little bit. My choice for the second best film of 1988 turns out to be the most popular film of 1988, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, a technical marvel, the finest mixture of live action and animation in film history, with the great English actor Bob Hoskins, sort of a cartoon figure himself, sometimes with his blustering presence, bridging the gap between the real world and the world of tunes. Hoskins plays a detective trying to track down a murder in a cartoon world. Hold still, will ya? Does this help? Yeah, thanks. I suppose everything's been said about the technical qualities of this film. Some people found it a little cold at the end. I was mesmerized by the way the film seemed to stretch the boundaries of time and space, really using the film medium while dazzling my eyes. I saw the film twice. I wasn't disappointed the second time. And neither was I. Uh, you know, there are a lot of reasons to go to the movies, and this movie you know, corresponds to a lot of the basic reasons why it entertains us, it excites us, but it also delights our mind, because as we're looking at this combination of live action and animation, it's causing us to redefine what space is in the movies. That's exactly and we realize point. that actually real people on the screen are no more real than the cartoons are. Correct. It's all the same thing in a way. And that kind of, of, of puzzle really delighted me as I was watching That's the movie. That's exactly the yeah. point I was making. It really just spun my head a little bit. When we come back, Gene and I will each reveal our choices for the best movie of 1988. And now my selection of the best film of 1988. It's the film that caused the most controversy during the year, Martin Scorsese's The Last Temptation of Christ, based on Nikos Kazantzakis' novel, which met head-on the issue of God and man and man and God, as represented by Jesus Christ, who questions his own nature and mission on earth. Here's Jesus defending Mary Magdalene's right to enter a wedding. What do you think heaven's like? It's like a wedding. God's the bridegroom, and man's spirit's the bride. The wedding takes place in heaven, and everyone's invited. That's Willem Dafoe in the performance of the year as Jesus, certainly the most compelling Jesus ever put on film. Because he shares his doubts, we feel more comfortable with our own. And because he successfully battles his temptations, we are encouraged to combat our own. I can't think of a more religious film I can't think of a film that could do more as a religious film, but to offer both comfort and challenge to all mankind. The Last Temptation of Christ has the greatest reach of any film this year, and it achieves its goal. I'm glad it caused so much debate. It's that good a film. It's a very effective film. It's not on my best ten list, hmm. though, because I felt that the issues in the film, the issues that I thought about, the divinity of Jesus Christ, the duality of the fact that he was both man and God, although they were very stimulating and they made me really think about that issue, the film itself, it seemed to me, fell a little bit short of the top 10 list. It's on my top 20 list, if that means anything, because it was a little bit 
unstructured, a little bit unclear as to exactly where it was going. Individual scenes work, but the overall pattern was Obviously, there. I didn't have any problem uh, following it at all. I thought it was perfectly organized, and um, I was quite moved by it. In fact, just giving that review there, I was a little chilled. Because well, I, I, I tell you, I... <laughs> I just haven't. I think it's uh, the equivalent of a recruiting film for Christianity. I think it's a fabulous picture. And that's kind of ironic because a lot of Christians didn't think that people should be able to see the Last Temptation of Christ. And they hadn't seen it themselves. <laughs> hadn't seen it themselves. I think they should. <laughs> okay, my choice for the number one spot, the best movie of the year, is Alan Parker's Mississippi Burning, a powerful and absolutely spellbinding drama about the early days of the civil rights movement in the American South. The movie takes place in Mississippi in 1964, shortly after three civil rights workers have disappeared and are feared dead. Two very different FBI agents go to the state to head the investigation. One of them is a bright young man played by Willem Dafoe, who was also in The Last Temptation of Christ, so he appeared in the number one film of the year on both of our lists. The other one in this scene is a weather-beaten old pro played by Gene Hackman. Simple fact is, Anderson, we got two cultures down here. White culture, and the colored culture. Now, that's the way it always has been. That's the way it always will be. The rest of America don't see it that way, Mr. Mayor. The rest of America don't mean Jack. You in Mississippi now. Uh, that's for sure. And right there, you may be looking at another Academy Award performance by this gifted and hardworking actor who never seems to give a bad performance, but is rarely given a better one than in Mississippi Burning. This movie is partially a thriller and a whodunit, but it's also a story about human nature and about the way that racism can affect not only a community, but even individual lives, making people miserable because they know in their hearts that they're wrong. That's certainly the case with the local woman in the movie, played wonderfully by Frances McDermott. She wants to provide an alibi for her husband, but she feels guilty about it, and it's her conscience that provides Hackman with the key to crack open the case. Mississippi Burning works as great drama and great melodrama, too. It's the best movie of the year, on my list anyway. Yeah, it uh, didn't make my top 10, but it would have been about uh, 12 when I started competing. It gets, uh, I had actually about 21 films uh, this year that were competing for the top 10 slots. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, it's a little bit formula in the sense of the two cops together solving this case. It's not done in a formula way. It's done expertly and acted wonderfully. And I'm glad you focus on the Frances McDormand character, who's really pivotal in this yes. thing, as the love interest and investigation interest of Gene Hackman. I think she's what, oddly enough, lifts the film into the best films of the year category. You know, one of the strange things is that when some of the Vietnam movies came out a few years ago, like Platoon, yeah. uh, the prime movie-going generation, which is, let's say, between 17 and 25, were really not familiar firsthand with the right. Vietnam War at all. It's the same with the Civil Rights oh, Movement. No question. I went to see this movie to screen. You see people walking out saying, were things really like that, you know, yeah. in America? And I'm saying, this was so recently that the cars are still on the road. This was yeah. 24 years ago. That's how much things have changed. People need to know that. Yeah, I think they're surprised by the amount of hate that's on the screen, and that's a tribute to the film. Here now, from bottom to top, is my top ten list. Number 10 is Working Girl, the old-fashioned story of a young woman trying to make it in the business world. Melanie Griffith stars, Mike Nichols directs. Number 9, Phil Kaufman's The Unbearable Lightness of Being, the most erotic film of the year, set against the political struggle of Prague in 1968. Number 8, Marcel Ophel's scathing documentary, Hotel Terminus, The Life and Times of Klaus Barbie, which is more than a prosecution of an infamous Nazi Gestapo leader. It's an indictment of all of the people who protected him for 40 years, including the American intelligence community. Number seven, Errol Morris's The Thin Blue Line, a very different documentary, a poetic, elliptical one that tries to prove the innocence of a man who received a life sentence for the murder of a Dallas policeman. Number six, Martin Bress's Midnight Run, the best action comedy of the year, featuring the best duet of the year. The comic relationship between Robert De Niro as a bounty hunter and Charles Grodin as the hunted. Number five, Lawrence Kazan's Bittersweet, The Accidental Tourist, starring William Hurt as a hyper-organized man whose life is really falling apart. And now my top four again. Number four, Little Dorrit. Number three, The Hilarious Bull Durham. Number two, Who Framed Roger Rabbit? And finally, number one, the best film of 1988, according to me, Martin Scorsese's The Last Temptation of Christ. Okay, now here's my complete list of the year's top ten films. Number ten, Running on Empty, directed by Sidney Lumet. The story of two 60s radicals who have been running ever since and trying to raise a family at the same time. Number nine, the brilliant documentary, Dear America, Letters Home from Vietnam, which combined letters from American troops in Vietnam with dramatic footage of the war they fought. 
Number eight, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, directed by Robert Zemeckis, with animation by Richard Williams. Number seven, Vim Vender's haunting movie, Wings of Desire, about an angel who wants to be a human because he would rather have real physical feelings than live forever. Number six on my list, the year's funniest comedy, A Fish Called Wanda, about a gang of incompetent crooks caught in the cockeyed British legal establishment. Number five, Salam Bombay by Mira Nair, a movie shot on the streets of Bombay and telling the dramatic story of a boy who lives and survives and even prevails there. And of course, my top four films, reviewing them again, number four, Shy People, number three, The Unbearable Lightness of Being, number two, The Accidental Tourist, and number one, the year's best film, Alan Parker's Mississippi Burning. So, good year, good list. And the first time that we ever each picked a film as number one that wasn't on the other guy's top ten list. That's it for this week. Next time, The Dark Side of 1988, <laughs> the worst films of the year. And as usual, we won't be picking on the small stuff. No, we'll be going after the big losers and the big stars. That's next time. And until then, the balcony is closed. Raisinets and Goobers are playing everywhere, starring plump, juicy raisins and great golden peanuts. Both now feature creamy Nestle milk chocolate. Johnny Cat Premium Cat Litter. Johnny Cat and a little privacy is all any cat needs. Travel Savers, the nation's leading chain of independent travel agencies. Consult your yellow pages for the Travel Savers agency nearest you. Ask for our specially priced cruises. Travel Savers. Tap and Sure Cook Space Saver Microwave is perfect for kitchens where space is at a premium. Tap and Touch solid state controls and automatic temperature probe furnished by Tappan.